Hi, my name's Drew, and I'm going to be walking you through the R-Pod 180 today. Uh, we'll be going through it inside and out, checking overall condition of everything and function. I'm going to teach you how to use everything. Uh, right up front here, we have an electric tongue jack. Uh, a couple features to this is you have a nice bright light on the underside that's going to give you a point of reference if you are backing up to it in the dark. Also, is going to light your area here if you are doing any uh, coupling or uncoupling procedures after dark. Uh, you can use that light to help you with that. Uh, we do have up or down operation here on the jack as well that is clearly marked uh, in terms of direction there. So, uh, Also, uh, in the event of a power loss situation, we have a manual drive option here on the, uh, on the top side. Uh, you'll use that crank handle from the top, again, to, to manually crank that up or down. Uh, directly behind there, we have a 20 pound propane tank that is going to be full for you. Uh, open, and close, open and close valve is on the top. I find that most people are uh, somewhat familiar with the operation of these propane cylinders. Uh, this is held onto the trailer or onto the tongue, I should say, by this wing nut here. If we rotate that out, that's going to loosen that tension on that uh, band and we can go ahead and, of course, disconnect your uh, pigtail there and pull that on out of there. Uh, this is all covered by your propane cover here. Now this sits on towards the rear uh, and if you put this on well enough your stud is going to, there is a stud here uh, and it is going to transition there from the outside and if I can get that lined up uh, Either way, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Just know that there is a stud there. It is held on there by a wing nut. And as you can see, it is not the easiest thing to do here uh, when you're pressed to do so. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then we have uh, your Group 24 deep cycle battery here. Um, from a maintenance standpoint, a few things that you are going to want to remember. Uh, number one is going to be uh, maintaining the water level of this battery. Uh, what that is going to entail is two or three times a year pulling these vent panels up, refilling with distilled water as necessary. Again, there is a clear marked water line in there. Uh, also for periods of long term uh, storage, uh, it is going to be best for that battery if you uh, disconnect these battery terminals. You can tape them up with some electrical tape if you'd like, uh, but keep them disconnected from the battery. Reason being is uh, backlits of dis black backlighting of displays and there's always some some things running in the background on that DC circuit uh, that keeps any of those nominal or phantom draws from compounding uh, over months of storage so just keep that in mind uh, coming around here to the side of the units we're gonna find uh, stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit uh, now those are just for stabilization they're not for leveling if we are leveling from front to back, we're going to use that main tongue jack up front. Leveling from left to right, we're going to use the tires uh, and what's called a leveling kit. So that will uh, essentially be underneath the tire to attain a certain level. So once you uh, have found your level, uh, you're going to use this crank handle. Uh, that's going to slip over that three quarter inch drive nut on the end of there. You'll come down, you'll make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to shore everything up. Uh, it, you'll be best suited in the long term to keep as much stress off of these jacks as you can. I recommend my customers use a light touch uh, it, you know, to, to keep them in better shape longer. Uh, brings us right here to the water heater. Now this is a, a six gallon capacity suburban branded water heater. Uh, couple things to remember is it is dual source, runs on 110 volt electricity, as well as propane gas uh, with 12 volt ignition. Now the way that Forest River does uh, their switching of the unit is they have two switches. One of them, which is going to be for the 110 volt heating element, is located directly on the water heater itself. The propane switch is going to be located on the inside and we're going to cover that operation of that switch on the inside. So down here, if we can get eyes on that switch, you have a on off toggle switch right here on the unit. It, it likes to hide uh, directly behind that propane regulator there. 
so that's how you're going to run it on 110 volt. As you can see, we are running it on propane as well, and, and you can feel free to do so. That is going to give you the highest recharge rates uh, using both sources. You're looking at about 17 gallons per hour. Uh, if you go ahead and use the uh, standalone propane side, you're going to be somewhere in between, you know, about 15 gallons per hour. Uh, lastly, if we're just using that electric element, uh, you're looking at about 11 gallons per hour. Uh, now, other than operation, uh, manufacturer has uh, some, some specific uh, maintenance procedures you're going to want to follow. Uh, number one is going to be draining the unit anytime it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. And the other part of that is going to be uh, not using the unit unless it has water in it. And we're going to talk about how to uh, get water out of the unit and how to get water into the unit. Uh, starting with how to drain the unit. So it is very important from a safety standpoint uh, that before we drain the unit, we not only give it ample time to cool down, uh, generally a lot longer than you would think, about eight hours, uh, but also we do need to depressurize the unit. So we're gonna let it cool down for eight hours. Uh, once we are certain that it is cooled down, we can go ahead on the inside uh, or really any spigot, and we're gonna turn the hot side of that spigot on. Uh, of course, before doing that, we have cut water, the inflow of water to the unit. Uh, so the idea is we turn that hot side of the spigot on, it's gonna release any pressure that has built up into the tank there. Uh, from there, uh, we are safe to actually drain the tank. So this is an inch and an eighth drain plug here. Uh, we're going to use an inch and an eighth socket and extension generally to pull that out. Uh, once we, again, depressurize the unit, we're safe to go ahead and drain it the rest of the way. So we back that drain plug out, and again, you should see maybe a five, get five to six gallons of water uh, drain from the appliance here uh, in this area. Uh, on the other side of that drain plug, uh, you're going to connect it to the back side. You're going to find an anode rod. Uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a uh, magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. Uh, they do deposit on the end of that or onto that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, now that is what we would consider a consumable part. I would expect to get a year or two in between having to change your anode rod. So just something to keep in mind there. Uh, starts out about three quarters of an inch in diameter. By the time it needs to be replaced, it'll be about the size of a pencil and look pretty decrepit. So it, it will be very clear that it does need to be changed. Uh, on the flip side of that conversation, of course, now we know how to get the water out of the unit for storage. Uh, before using the unit again, we are going to have to pump that water back in. Uh, easiest thing to do is now you are going to introduce water to the system. So either hook up your city water connection or draw that water up from the tank. But you would then again turn that hot side of the spigot on. Uh, from there that water, six gallons of water, is going to flow into the uh, hot water heater as long as, that hot, as long as that hot side of the spigot is on. So um, that flow initially at the spigot is going to be very airy, very interrupted. Uh, what you're seeing essentially is you're seeing the water pass through the tank here and, and then uh, come to the, the, the fixture. So by the time that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is the indicator that this does have six gallons of water in it. You would be, you would be uh, able to, to start the unit and run it properly. Uh, one last recommendation uh, is going to be uh, screening off these inlets and outlets here, or excuse me, the, the inlet and the exhaust here. Uh, mud daubers, flying insects are attracted to the smell of propane. So what often happens is they crawl directly through this, this screening. They make their dirt nest as close to the propane element as they can, uh, to the, the propane nipple as they can, uh, you know, restricting the, the operation of the appliance. So bug screenings not only with, for bug screens, not only for the water heater, but for the furnace, the refrigerator, I'll probably hammer that home a couple more times uh, during this presentation. Uh, so below the water heater, we have your sewage hose storage here. This does run the full width of the camper, it does have a door on either side. It's just a storage compartment for your sewage hose so you don't have to keep it uh, with your other gear. So 
nothing too crazy there. And if we come down super low, we have your drain there for your freshwater tank. Uh, now that is just what we're seeing here is the bottom of that tank. So that is just a cap on the end of that tank. We'll unscrew that. It's a gravity feed. That water is just going to drain out of there. You know, you do only have to drain that freshwater tank if it has been in use. Uh, and then right here as well, we have your low point drains. These are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. So everything in between water source and fixture is going to be uh, drained via these two valves here. Uh, again, manufacturer recommends that all of the water be evacuated from the unit if it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. Uh, that process is going to be something like this. You would drain your freshwater tank if it's been in use. Then you're going to come here, you're going to open up both of these valves. Again, this is the in-between plumbing, so everything in between water source and fixture is going to be drained here. Uh, from there, that last step is going to be draining the water heater uh, in the process that we just talked about. Uh, and then while we're here, uh, we have your furnace vent as well. Uh, this is an exhaust vent, so let it exhaust. Not going to want to put like a lawn chair or anything up in front of it. It does blow very hot air when it is on. Um, and again, a very large intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. So make sure we are screening those off. Uh, let me turn around and we'll talk about slide out maintenance here. Uh, very important with the Schwintex systems that you maintain those uh, once every 90 days. Uh, what that's going to entail for this is the use of a dry silicone lubricant here on these tracks, top to bottom, left to right. Those products come in an aerosol can, spray it down, run the slide in and out a few times to distribute that lubricant and you'll be in good shape with that. Uh, also, on that same maintenance schedule, we're going to want to condition these seals. Uh, you have these rubber seals running all the way around the slide. Uh, that slide seals in both directions, inside and out. Uh, here in the Texas sun, we want to keep these uh, as supple as we can. So once every 90 days, we are again going to use a seal conditioner on those. Of course, firstly, follow the directions on the can, but generally that they, it goes something like this where you'll spray that product on here. Generally, it comes out very bubbly. Uh, you'll wait until those bubbles dissipate, wipe off any excess, bring the slide in, and, and you're good for the next 90 days. Now the internal seals, of course, they're not exposed to the sun. Condition those once a year, you should be in good shape. Uh, refrigerator here, um, from a maintenance standpoint, not too terribly much you're going to be doing. Um, we don't really consider this a customer serviceable unit. Uh, it's going to be my recommendation that you give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure nothing's nesting in there, making sure you have no frayed wires, things like that. Just look at it and if it, to the best of your ability, if it looks uh, like it's okay, then, then you're good to go. Uh, but uh, again, a very large intrusion point for mud divers and flying insects. We will want to screen both the top and the bottom vent. So you have two vents on this particular model. We want to screen them both off. Uh, when you're putting these vents on, you are going to put the tabs up first, uh, line up the holes there on the bottom, and again, can be easier said than done sometimes. There's one, and then we give them a quarter turn there. You can use your, you know, your finger, your backside of a key, screwdriver, uh, but that is the locked position. That's going to keep that from falling off when you're going down the road. Uh, outside shower here, uh, you have access to hot and cold water, uh, nothing too, too crazy there in terms of function on off there on the head, uh, you know, so you can conserve your use of hot water, uh, when taking a shower, but this whole head will wrap up there and store into that compartment. Um, you know, if you keep wrapping it, uh, and then of course the door has a lock on it. So, um, Tire pressure and lug nuts. So very important to talk about tire pressure and lug nuts. Now these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot pounds here in our shop. Manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure. The first 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles, we want to go ahead and torque these lug nuts back down to 100 foot pounds. So very important. Um, these tires, this you driving this home, 
is essentially the first time this camper has been on the road. So as those wheels break in, it is very important to maintain that 100 foot pound torque. Manufacturer further recommends that uh, at the start of each trip there on after, we need to go ahead and make sure those are maintaining that 100 foot pound torque. Uh, tire pressure, I believe these ones are 65 PSI. Let me confirm that. 65 PSI on the tire pressure uh, is stamped onto the sidewall of the tire. I find that to be a little hard to find sometimes, so they do give you a, a data tag here that's going to let you know that tire pressure. Uh, 65 PSI is the max tire pressure rating. Uh, that is going to give you the highest flexibility in terms of weight. So whether you have the unit completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is a, uh, good, a good pressure to maintain. So, um, coming here to the dump valves, um, we have those color-coded dump valves, gray for gray water, black for black water. Black water is going to be anything from the toilets, any solid body waste uh, coming from the toilet is going to be black water. Anything from the sink or the shower is going to be gray water. Um, biggest thing with this is, is it's a good rule of thumb uh, to keep your black water closed uh, pretty much all the time. Um, use the monitor panel on the inside. Uh, as that tank fills up, you're only going to dump as necessary. So with that solid body waste, it is very important that we do keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Uh, that way it can evacuate the tank and flow down the drain easier. Uh, gray water, not as important as if you keep that open or closed. Of course, there is no solid body waste. Generally, it will fill up uh, quite a bit faster than the black. Uh, but it is a popular option to use that gray water to rinse the, the black water, um, you know, the sewage hose on the way out. Either way, treat these like a vacuum lock. Both of these valves, these valves should never be open at the same time. You don't want any kind of cross-contamination issues or anything like that. Um, and a bayonet style fitting here. Um, your sewage hose is going to connect the very same way that, that this cap comes off. So they both will have these keyholes. And of course, this trailer connection has those four prongs. You put that, put that in the halfway position there. Give it a quarter turn. It's going to go ahead and lock everything on. Uh, in conjunction with that black tank valve, we also have a black tank flush. So that corresponds with a jet inside the Blackwater tank, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, the limitation uh, to the flush is going to be the fact that there is no check valve on the top of the tank. There is nothing to keep that wastewater in the tank if you overflow it. What that means is the path of least resistance to the septic system is the rooftop vents. Uh, if you were to hook a water source into this and leave it indefinitely, it's going to eventually fill that black water tank, fill up that septic vents to the roof, and then essentially rain down on top of you. Uh, as horrific as that sounds, uh, it is easily preventable. Uh, if you leave water rushing in here for no longer than five minutes, uh, and then pulling this valve to evacuate that tank. Uh, if you have a friend with you, they can watch the monitor panel on the inside as it fills up tell you, hey, it's getting full, and then you can pull that black water valve there. Uh, either way, no longer than five minutes with water rushing in here, uh, something you want to be very diligent about um, maintaining as well. Cable satellite inlet here. Uh, now this is a standard RG6 cable fitting. Uh, out there in the wild, you'll probably find some hiring campgrounds, KOAs, they will often provide a park cable service. This would be the inlet of those services. It's a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area of the camper. Uh, so this again would be the inlet. The outlet is going to be at the TV. Uh, 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. This is your cord, comes with the unit. It is 30 feet in length and it only plugs into the camper one way. If you go ahead and look at that plug, it does only make sense that it is going to plug in one way. Once we are fully seated, you give it an eighth inch turn to the right, that locks it in, and we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and lock it in further. Coming around here to the back side, uh, nothing too terribly much to speak of. We have your full size spare here. Uh, although it is a different wheel, you're going to have a, a steely wheel here when you have those nice uh, 
rims there on the unit there. Uh, but it is a full size spare, so the size is the same. Uh, in the event that you do need to change the tire, put your jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as you can without it interfering into your work. Jack the unit up, change the chot, change the tire, uh, and then of course go on your way. So nothing too crazy. Um, here on this side, of course, nothing that really needs to be uh, discussed too much, but you have your uh, storage compartment there, magnetic hold opens, things like that. Um, I'm going to hop in and, oh, no, we got a power on him, so no need to grab the crank handle. We'll discuss that when we get to the inside there. Uh, steps are going to be up and in, and then same on the way out. Fold that down. A uh, couple all-weather 110 volt outlets here. Uh, nothing too crazy, just a standard 15 amp residential outlet. Um, sprayer hose here. Now this is a quick disconnect air hose style coupler. So if we were to slide this collar back, it's going to go ahead and spit that male end out. And then on the on the way in, it would be a slide that collar back, insert that male end fully. Once it clicks. Uh, it's going to automatically pressurize this hose and you're good to go. Uh, now, just a word of warning, uh, when you want to disconnect the, the hose, and the reason why I'm not disconnecting the hose, is you want to cut the flow of water to the unit uh, and depressurize the hose first and then disconnect here. Uh, if not, uh, you're probably going to get a little bit wet because it just does, uh, because it is under pressure, it's just going to give you a burst of water um, when you connect or disconnect. Uh, outside kitchen here. Uh, now, just let me start off by saying this whole outside kitchen is removable. So if in the event that you say, hey, I'd rather just have that storage compartment, you do have a single bar latch here uh, that you could unlock and pull this out, store it in your garage, get rid of it, whatever. Uh, but you do have this cooktop here. And of course, with the water sprayer there, it could be a, a very usable secondary kitchen. Uh, now this uses a quick disconnect coupler as well. So you'll find a, a propane line in the unit uh, and you'll go ahead and you'll utilize this coupler here. So we will again have that quick disconnect collar. So we'll slide that back. We'll insert the male end there. We'll have to turn the valve on there. And then we'll find a similar connection point here on the underside uh, where we will uh, hook the other side of that cord there. So, uh, that just about covers it here on the outside. We're going to hop on the inside and start going over things in there. So here we are in the bathroom of the unit. Uh, nothing really too crazy to talk about in here. Uh, of course, you have those pretty standard, um, you know, fixtures here. Um, toilet is going to be a pedal style flush. Uh, will be a light, light press there to fill up the bowl. Uh, full press to flush. Um, you know, kind of kind of your standard stuff in here uh, with storage compartments and a nice little holder there for toiletries, things like that. Uh, on off switch is right there to the left of the door when you uh, walk in. Uh, you have this nice uh, shower curtain there with that magnetic hold open. Uh, it does give you the illusion of a lot more space than you actually have there when you are taking a shower. Um, Shower head is going to be that pretty standard RV style uh, with the on off uh, switch there on the head. Now you'll probably find yourself in order to conserve the accessibility of uh, hot water, uh, you are going to probably be doing Navy or military style showers there. So again, nothing too out of the realm here to talk about in the bathroom, um, but it is here. So uh, coming out of the restroom. Uh, we're going to come back here to the uh, door. Uh, when you see uh, to the right of the entry door, we have your light switches here. Uh, these first one's going to be what they like to call a courtesy light. So just a light you can hit, a common switch coming into the door that is going to light your uh, path. 
uh, porch light here. Uh, again, that's going to be that amber colored light we saw outside um, on the side of the unit. And then we have your awning light switch. Now, the awning lights on this unit are going to be uh, on the actual upper tube part. So I'm not sure if you can see that reflecting off my hand there, uh, but they are right here. And I do believe those were on when we were on the outside. I'm not sure if we got that on camera. Now, when we run this awning out, which is going to be this switch here, if I were to go about any further than that on the way out, I would want to close the door first. So I'm going to close the door and we're going to run that awning all the way out. And then um, we are going to, uh, maybe we'll talk about actually like the legs and how they function there. Uh, after we finish up with the inside, we'll probably cut to that and you can see that. So, um, slide in and out room. Uh, this is that Schwintec system. Uh, so what that means is you have two independently geared motors that is pushing that out, uh, and in, I should say, uh, what that means for you is come fully in, go fully out. Now there's an electric brake on the switch. So what that means is hold that button until it stops in both directions. Uh, so that way you are 100% you are sure that it is fully extended or fully retracted. So just hold the button until it stops. Um, here in the dinette, now this dinette does make a secondary sleeping area. Uh, this is what you would call a pedestal style table. Uh, so you would wrestle this tabletop uh, from these poles here. Uh, once you get the tabletop off, uh, disconnect the pole there from the flange. Now this is all just a friction fit uh, here. Now you take that tabletop and you can see these black bumpers here. Uh, you're just going to rest that tabletop on those bumpers. Go ahead and take these rear cushions uh, and lay them over the tabletop. So, uh, that does make a, a, a sleeping area probably you know best suited for a small child or something that is pretty small. Uh, here in the kitchen, we have, of course, have your, your pre-wired for solar sticker. Uh, what that means is you have, uh, solar connections there on the roof. If you wanted to do a hard mounted panel up there, you could do so. And this is just indicating that this is where you would, uh, mount that charge controller. This is where those wires terminate back behind this wall panel. Uh, we have your courtesy panel, your convenience center here, uh, does go by many names. They all pretty much function the same. Uh, what we have here is a series of lights and the hot, the more lights you see, the fuller it is. So we have a battery indicator here, uh, low, fair, good, charged. And then we have empty one third, two thirds full. If I push the battery corresponding with what I'm trying to check, if I, excuse me, the button that I'm check the button corresponding with what I want to check, it's going to illuminate those lights. And again, the more lights we see, the fuller it is. Water heater switch here. Uh, again, we talked about the electric element, how that switch is on the outside. This switch is going to be for the propane water heater. Uh, now, when you light this switch or turn this switch on, you may notice that this red light will come on as well. It's not coming on right now because we are fully up to temperature on that water heater. What this is indicating on whether or not your water heater has lit. Um, so. These water heaters on propane gas, they'll cycle three times. If they do not light by the end of that third cycle, they're going to shut down uh, and that light is going to stay lit. So if you, if you try and light it, you come back five minutes later and that light is on, your water heater did not light. So oftentimes you're either out of gas up front, you don't have your valve on, or maybe oftentimes it just takes a couple tries for your gas to travel through the line to the actual appliance. Uh, either way, in the event that that happens, just flip the switch off, turn it back on. Uh, and, and it generally, as long as that issue has been corrected, will light uh, the first try of that second cycle. And then we have your water pump switch here. Of course, it goes without saying that both of these switches are on when they are illuminated. Uh, below that, we have a couple USB chargers for phones, any other USB driven appliances. Those are 12 volt outlets there. So you will have access to those off grid. Thermostat here. Uh, you have one central thermostat to control the heat or, and the air conditioner of the unit. Uh, this is a touch button thermostat. So if I push that mode button one time, that's going to turn everything on. Now, before I go further into any other selections, I do need to choose a fan speed. 
my choices here are going to be low, high, and auto. Uh, just like a, reg a residential thermostat, if I choose either low or high, that fan is going to run indefinitely whether or not it reaches the temperature here. Uh, also, if I'm trying to go to, to say, propane furnace, or excuse me, the furnace, um, that fan on the air conditioner will continue to run even if I am, um, again, trying to light the furnace. So to keep it kind of going right with me, sticking right with me, uh, and performing as expected, I'm going to go into that auto side of it. So I'm just going to confirm that selection there by hitting it one more time. That's going to take me into the air conditioner side of the thermostat. Uh, it is indicated by the snowflake here. It says cool. And then my fan speed is there in that middle portion, which is auto. And then it is 74 degrees in here. To change that temperature up or down, I can go ahead and push those arrows up or down. So nothing too crazy there. Uh, now, if I hit that one more time, that's gonna take me into that furnace mode. And then again, it's, it says furnace here, auto there. So now, since I have that on auto, this air conditioner is gonna kick down here once it realizes what I'm trying to do. Uh, once that kicks off, that blower motor is going to come on instantaneous. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites by that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. And we can hear that lighting as we speak. Uh, and then one more is going to be off. Now, since that furnace has already lit, it goes, it's going to go through a cool down procedure. Uh, generally, that's about two minutes while that blower motor still runs, uh, blowing off that excess heat. Uh, here in the kitchen, I mean, nothing really too crazy to speak of. We have your uh, fixture there, uh, nice round sink with that countertop extender there. Uh, we have your uh, cook stove or your cooktop here. This is a suburban um, cooktop, uh, very basic in features though. You do need a long stem barbecue lighter uh, paired with this unit to light it. Uh, you'll turn the knob here to light. Uh, go ahead and, and hold that down uh, with your flame directly on the burner. So very much, uh, if you ever used a Coleman camp stove or anything like that, it is very uh, similar operation to that. Uh, although you do have this nice tempered glass uh, countertop extender uh, to go ahead and make this a more workable space when you are not using that. Uh, jumping over here to the refrigerator. Uh, this is a three-way refrigerator. Uh, works very well uh, on all of those sources. If I had to say it was limited on one, it would be that 12-volt source. Uh, these ammonia absorption systems, uh, ammonia absorption refrigerators, are not known to be very efficient on that 12-volt side of things. Uh, it can also, uh, you know, very, you know, uh, draw down your battery very, very quickly. So keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that anytime this is plugged into the bumper of your vehicle, it is at that point in time one large vehicle. So uh, I have heard that these can actually leach off of your car battery if they are connected. It is that power hungry that it will uh, very quickly use all of the battery on the, the, the separate battery that is up front on the unit uh, and then leach off your automotive battery. So be aware of that. Of course, if you are wanting to use it on 12 volt, go ahead and unplug it from your vehicle. Uh, it is our opinion as a dealership, because of the limitations of that 12 volt side, we rec recommend for most of our customers to just not use it. Um, but that is of course up to you. Uh, propane is going to be the next, that's denoted there by the, the flame. Uh, this appliance itself runs most efficiently on propane. Uh, what that means for you as a consumer uh, is it can, you know, you can run for probably about a week on that single bottle of propane. Uh, running this on the refrigerator. Now, because it is so efficient on that 12 volt, or excuse me, on that propane side of things, uh, what happens is when you kick it here into the propane, if the refrigerator has not been used for a while, that propane gas has been evacuated from the line uh, and it has then filled up with air. So as I turn that on, what I'm getting at is it may take a couple tries, a couple lighting tries uh, to actually get that to light on propane. Now, if this were to fail to light on propane, it's going to start yelling at me, blinking, making a beeping noise, um, and that's going to be flashing there. If I push that, in the event that that happens, if I push that little button there, it's acknowledgement uh, that it did not light. It will then uh, essentially reset and try and light again. 
So that's going to be your kind of code reset, uh, however you want to think about it. Uh, and then we have, uh, of course, the plug is uh, 110 volt electricity. Uh, you'll use that in the capacity of an RV park or if you're pre-cooling this in your driveway, something like that. Um, again, very straightforward. Uh, we have your temperature control here. So the more bars you see, the colder it is. Um, here on the inside, uh, we have uh, not only a removable ice box, so that is completely removable. Uh, to remove it, uh, our directions right there. If we're storing the unit and we want to keep the door open, we have that little guy, he folds out. Uh, that's going to allow the door to not fully close and keep it from getting mildewy or develop any strange smells in there. Um, and then you do have those uh, fancy blue lights in there. Uh, up top here, we have your three-way um, oven, microwave, grill. Uh, this appliance is one of my all-time favorite RV appliances. These work tremendously well. Um, they have a heating element up top there, um, you know, so they function kind of like a toaster oven. They are, of course, a convection oven and a, a, a traditional microwave. Uh, all of your controls are going to be up here at the top. A lot of times you do have to like preheat them. Uh, again, it does have its own service manual. It is very user friendly, very easy to figure out. If you do have any questions of that further, please just give us a call. Uh, we can generally walk you through that stuff over the phone. Um, here on this side, we have your stereo system here. Uh, this is a Bluetooth uh, receiver as well as uh, AM FM radio and a couple uh, inlets here, a 3.5 millimeter jack inlet, uh, HDMI inlet, USB inlet. So anything you feed into here is going to pass through uh, the stereo and essentially hit the television set here. So uh, to, to choose your sources, those are going to be all up top here. And we do have different zones. So zone one is going to, of course, be the inside of the unit. Zone two is going to be the outside of the unit. And you'll control each zone's volume separately. Uh, again, uh, does have its own separate service manual uh, included with the units, although this is, this is very easy to, to kind of navigate through. Uh, but if you do have any questions, either consult the manual or please give us a call. Uh, TV uh, is positionable, so you can bring that out uh, and it can, you can position that to wherever you are um, you know, sitting in the camper. Uh, but uh, we want to make sure, uh, and there is a buckle for it, uh, we do want to make sure that it is buckled in before we're going down the road. So. Uh, other than that, uh, of course, your emergency exit is there. Uh, if you are particularly motivated enough, you can go ahead and open these uh, latches on both sides. That's going to push full out like a doggy door. So again, if you're particularly motivated enough, you can yank that screen out of the way. Uh, hop on out of there um, to safety. Uh, up top here, 9 volt smoke alarm. Um, runs on a 9 volt battery. It'll let you know when it needs to be changed. Uh, we recommend testing all of your safety equipment before each trip. Uh, and that is going to include your smoke alarm, your carbon monoxide LP leak detector there. All of these do have test buttons on them. You will also want to test your fire extinguisher, which I believe is by the door in this unit. Yep, so test tab on the top, push that green tab down. If it springs back, uh, you still have life in it. If not, it's time to pull out and replace. So let's make sure we are testing our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, down low here, uh, we have the ReadyVac. Um, you, of course, have a switch on here. I'm not going to turn it on because it is pretty loud. Uh, that would be if you want to use a hose attachment for this, you can do so. So this portion of the road vac here, uh, you have a little slider there you can open. Uh, the thought process is, is that you would use a, a broom here to sweep the floor more traditionally, and then you would sweep your pile uh, here towards this mouth. Uh, once that opens up, it's going to draw that in. Uh, now this does have a bag back behind this actual unit. Uh, you'll take a flat bladed screwdriver 
uh, and do your best to kind of softly pry this this front piece off. Back there, you're going to find a replaceable bag. Of course, before throwing the old bag out, make sure you take note of the size you need uh, to utilize that. Uh, also here, uh, we do have your main GFI outlet. All the receptacles in this unit are on the same circuit. So if one of them were to get overloaded, that's gonna knock out function to all of them. Uh, and just like in your bathroom at home, and as you can see, the, re the refrigerator is yelling at me saying we don't have any power. Um, that's going to be the reset point there. So um, just a, a, a standard GFI outlet. So, uh, that just about covers it here on the inside. Uh, oh, one thing we forgot is going to be the fuse panel breaker box. Uh, everything you see there on the right is going to be your automotive blade style fuses. Um, not a bad idea to pick up a variety pack of fuses with the units. Uh, it's going to be these guys here. And then everything on the left is going to be those uh, light switch style breakers. Uh, those are the same variants you're probably going to see at home. Uh, they are manually resetting breakers, so you just flip them in the up position. So everything is labeled here on the door in terms of function. So, uh, that does just about cover it here on the inside. If you do have any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to give us a call. We can generally walk you through most of these uh, things over the phone. Uh, and uh, if you do have any questions, just give us a call. Thank you. So here we are on the outside. We do have this awning out. Uh, it is an eight foot awning, so it does go a little bit further than we have it here, but uh, you can really position it really at any, um, anywhere along the way. So um, once it is in this position, you can go ahead and pop these legs out. You'll have a, a leg on that side too, so just use your thumb to pry that out. Uh, it should come very easily. Uh, now you do have two options here. You can, um, of course, slide that down. Uh, that will, um, of course, we want this foot to be flat on the ground. Uh, so once we get there, we can really choose a pitch if we want. So we can actually put some, some pressure on here. And this motion here is, is you want to lock that back. So once you put some pressure on there, that's going to lock it in that back position. And that's the kind of the motion you're looking for there. So you want it to be locked back like so. Uh, you do got to kind of put some stress on these plastic pieces here. I've never seen one break, so um, I wouldn't be afraid to kind of put it into position there. Uh, but from here, again, the idea is that you would, you would get a position here and then you would stake the leg down into the ground. Now you also have the option of coming back to the camper, uh, which is probably the more popular of the options. Uh, same kind of premise is where this leg is going to be free floating. Uh, we are going to come to the trailer connection here and we are going to lift this up. That's going to unlock it. We're going to put the bottom of the foot down first uh, and then lock it in. Now from there, it is still that same basic idea where we can adjust uh, the pitch of the awning. And once we get it to where we like it, we'll go ahead and lock it in there. Now this is the exact same process for both legs, but on the way in, uh, again, we are just going to push that in. We'll make sure that that tab is locked down. Uh, when we're placing the foot up here, or the leg, I should say, we want that foot to be flat against that uh, piece of aluminum there, and then locking it back in uh, just like we pulled it out. So that's that motion there. We want that to snap back in. Everything is gonna be fully secured there. Um, and then, of course, you bring the awning back. Now, just for your information, the awning is not designed to be used for any amount of time without the legs supporting it in either the down position or the trailer bound connection. So um, it is unacceptable to use it in this capacity for any amount of time. So there's your awning.